Hi, everybody. Welcome in. Um, thanks, Eli, for that intro. Um, yeah, I want to start off by just taking a little bit of a blast to the past. It was, uh, it was 2018, 2019, November. We were at a conference talking about some of the biggest questions that are that we have to answer right now and trying to come up with big, bold answers to them. And Alex was invited to speak at this conference about essential questions, right? What are essential questions and what are the essential questions of our time? And one of the questions that he invited everybody to reflect on was what makes what makes us uniquely human? The clicker doesn't want to work now <laughs> for some reason. Um, OK, I'll continue as we smooth that. <laughs> um, so this was the question that he asked the, the gathering. And, um, and a lot of people started to offer some answers. And, Every time somebody proposed an option, we were able to answer back about AI options, animals, and plants. And Alex continued because that was just one of the examples of essential questions of our time. And I mean, it's more important than ever now. We're getting, we, we're essentially asking ourselves this question every single day. And I was just milling on it and really trying to answer this truly and get something that satisfied me. And I thought, what if it's our predilection for self-harm to hurt ourselves, right? We may be the only creatures that lay our own traps, bait them, are lured by them, and then get caught in them, right? No other machine or animal seems to do this, to know what is harmful for us, know that, the neg that there are negative consequences, and still do it, right? So there seems to be something that's warping our, our behavior and our motivations there. And we like to call this the self-destructive force. So this is essentially the drive that is underlying our intention and our will that warps how we act so that we go against our better judgment and bear the negative consequences that we can anticipate. So when you think about this, it's affecting us at an individual to a species level. For example, in the US alone, at any given time, 72% of us have an unhealthy behavior. So this is lack of exercise, poor sleep, excessive eating, or alcohol use, or tobacco use, right? And it's not that we don't know that that's bad for us, right? We do. We know what's healthy. And yet, we keep doing this at such a large scale. And I mean, it shows up on our New Year's resolutions, right? Those are the kinds of things that we put at the top of our lists every year. And yet, studies have shown that by February, 80% of us have failed to meet our resolutions. Right? So we do know what's better, but we are not acting in accordance to that. Yeah, and the, the question is, is this a new thing? Is this something that is part of um, our modern life that didn't happen before? So <clears throat> it just takes a quick look uh, into our past as, as humans to realize that this force has been present there pretty much forever. I mean, if we look at most of the creation stories of most cultures in the world, there is evidence there of examples or stories about how we, knowing better, end up acting against our best interests. And uh, uh, in, in more factual ways, um, the quintessential example is what happened uh, on an island off the coast of Chile, about 400 years ago, called Easter Island. Uh, and this was it's very far from, from mainland. And uh, there was a, a very successful culture there, Rapa Nui. And, um, and it disappeared. And it disappeared in a very um, tragic way. Uh, there is evidence that shows that there was over um, 
uh, utilization of the soil. Uh, the community um, started to, to have internal tensions and kill each other. And they, what they did was so extreme that they even uh, eliminated the trees that would be needed to escape once they run out of food. So uh, there are reports that suggest that they ended up eating rats and each other. And they were trapped within that island, uh, unable to, to leave, because even the trees that they could have used first to, to fish, and they would eat dolphins as part of their diet, but then to go to mainland were gone. Okay? And, and, and this example uh, reflects a lot of what has happened, even from older times. Um, the first empire about which we have uh, evidence is the Akkadian Empire in Mesopotamia or Mesopotamia. And, and this empire um, flourished about 24 uh, centuries before our era, okay? more than 4,000 years ago. And uh, again, very successful, uh, very sophisticated, and yet they didn't manage to, to keep going. There was a lot of corruption amongst the ruling classes. They over uh, uh, cultivated the land. They had erosion. Uh, their sources of food pretty much uh, dwindled, and they became very weak and easy to, to be defeated by, by their enemies. And, and this is just the first empire about which we know anything. But then if you look forward, this is what has happened with pretty much any other effort that we humans have made to live together in large numbers and flourish and keep okay, our societies uh, going. So we, it happened to the Mongols. It happened to uh, the Macedonians. Okay, we talk about Alexander the Great, gone. Uh, the Roman Empire. And, uh, and more recently, well, the Austro-Hungarian -Hung Austro Empire and the British Empire, all of them. And what we see is pretty much a repeat of this story. Yeah? So somehow, it's not lack of resources, lack of knowledge. We figure out ways in which we start to make decisions that go against our own interests and collapse. So today, um, it's not surprising for any of us to uh, conclude that we are accelerating our self-destruction. And, uh, and climate change, let's say, is the most prominent of, of, the, of the topics. And um, we have had climate weeks in New York City since the year 2009. Um, and uh, we have plenty of evidence that the, the changes that are occurring to, to our climate are induced by us humans. Uh, we know what we need to be doing to, to deal with this. And yet, and yet, these diagrams you are seeing there are uh, describing what is known as the uh, planetary boundaries. And, and this green area here is uh, the set of conditions. There are nine planetary boundaries. And, and this green area is where we should stay to, to maintain the conditions that we have had for over 10,000 years. It's called the Holocene, which is the period of, of time during which humanity managed to, uh, to, to develop as a, as a species. And ideally, we shouldn't go beyond the border of the green. Okay? And there are nine areas. One of them is climate change, this area right here. By the time of the first climate week in New York in 2009, we had crossed three of the nine. In 2023, 2023, six of the nine planetary boundaries had been crossed. And these boundaries have relationship with each other. Okay, we are talking about pollution. We are talking about acidification of the ocean. They, they are not separate entities. Okay? And, and look at the picture that we have, that we have now. And if we remain in the six, in the, in the green area, or in the green area, we'll be resilient. So we are threatening our own resilience, and we, things are not improving. <coughs> so we have had um, meetings organized by United Nations. We have been, as 
when we say we is humans. We have uh, issued reports, we have signed treaties. Every country in the world expressing commitment to try to, uh, to revert climate change. And, and there are graphs like this that plot or that show at the same time, time, these are the years, and then we have the accumulation of parts per, mission, per million of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, and the colors describe the temperature. Okay? And we have had meetings, meetings after meetings, and discussions, and pleas, and promises, and commitments, and all that. And despite all of these meetings, all of these accords, all of these treaties, the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere keeps accumulating, and our temperature keeps increasing. Okay, and now we are seeing every year seems to be breaking a record. Mm -hmm. So this is a clear example. Like we know what we need to do, right? We are talking about solutions. We're gathering, and yet the situation keeps getting worse, right? So then that starts to make us think, what could possibly be fueling this self-destructive force? Let's go there, right? What's going on there? So there are Po there are several possible answers, and one of them could be, oh, oh was it not on the entire, oh. oops, <laughs> minor detail. Uh, so one of the possible sources fueling the self-destructive force could be our relationship with ourselves through time. So this is the idea that we, we can consider ourselves now with like a closer relationship and our future self almost like a stranger or somebody that we don't know as well. So with a simple exercise, you can start to see that a little. So try to imagine your next birthday, your next birthday celebration. What does that look like? Try to see yourself in that scene. And then consider your birthday 20 years from now. How do you see yourself in that scene, right? This disconnect between who you are sooner versus later starts to shift how we behave. Because if we don't really know that person, we are not really connected with that person, then we make decisions that, you know, we, we'll, that's that person's problem kind of thing. And studies have actually found that people who have a closer relationship with their future self, they accumulate more assets, they exercise more, they make more ethical decisions, and they, uh, they procrastinate less, right? So it's really fascinating, this, this notion. Uh, there's another idea, which is our negativity bias. Yeah, because we humans, seem to pay more attention to what is um, not good okay, or negative. And uh, this may have a, an evolutionary advantage. I mean, if we go back, back, back in time, um, when we were just starting uh, uh, to colonize the Earth as a species, um, those of us or those of our ancestors who detected signals and interpreted them as something that could threaten their survival and do something about that. Run, okay, for example, had a greater chance of survival than those who had the same, received the same signals and noticed them and thought that it was nothing to worry about. So in a way, we might be the children of the paranoid who survived. Yeah? And, uh, uh, at that time, we had a lot of predators, a lot of uh, um, challenges to even secure our food every day. But if we fast forward to now, we have pretty much uh, controlled every predator that could hurt us. And we have in most uh, places, or in the world in general, we have an overabundance of, of food. So what if a possibility behind uh, this self-destructive uh, self force is some kind of inertia. We are still okay, uh, uh, concerned about our safety. We may start seeing each other as the biggest predator for ourselves, other people. And, uh, and, and that inse food insecurity we used to experience or the lack of resources may be motivating us now to hoard as much as possible and to try to secure 
what we think we need to survive uh, regardless of the consequences that it may have for other people or other places or the planet. Mm -hmm. And then it gets us to like really focus on the negative rather than the constructive and give more attention to negative stimuli. Another potential source, and it sounds kind of crazy at the beginning, but could be mind manipulators. So it's, imagine the scene of an ant just going out of its nest on its mission with other ants to go and get some food. And as it's going, it steps on a spore. And that spore enters its body. And it starts to travel to his, to his brain. And the ant is behaving totally normal, completely normal. Goes about its day, comes back. Goes about its day, comes back. And then one day, it's in the single file on its way to get some food with the other ants. And then all of a sudden, it breaks from the pack. The spore, the cordyceps, makes, moves the ant's legs and body to break from the pack, climb up a stalk, bite down, and then it bursts from his head, from its head. And this actually exists. Um, this is a cordyceps, and a fungi, and then it actually pours down more spores on the ants below. So this fungi actually took over the mind and body of the ant and made it do what it wanted in service of the reproduction and growth of the, the cordyceps. So yes, that sounds kind of creepy and crazy, but it's not impossible. We have other uh, substances that can change our, our minds and our behaviors. And one of them is called Toxoplasma gondii. And uh, what it does is it, 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 it gets into rats, and then it makes rats less afraid of cats. And so it makes them a little bit more bold and risk-taking. And, and then that's great for the cats, because then the cats get easy food. But what's in it for the fungi, for the uh, for toxo in this case? That's where it's in the cat's bodies where it re can reproduce, right? So, so sure, this makes us think, okay, well, you know, it's just rats and ants and cats, and that's that's their problem. We're fine. But um, the fact that this parasite uh, could control a mouse or a rat to the point when they lost fear from cats and, and were easier to be eaten, happened about 2000. Since then, interest has been growing uh, to study if it affects us. And uh, there are tests to, to determine whether we have been exposed or we are infected with this parasite. And apparently, roughly 30% of the population of the world, of humans in the world, uh, have been infected by this parasite. And uh, there have been studies in terms of human behavior and having a positive test to talk so. And on the one hand, uh, yes, it has been shown, for example, that uh, people who are positive are more likely uh, to study um, entrepreneurship if they are going for, for a career or to become entrepreneurs than if we are not infected by uh, this uh, parasite. So risk-taking behavior seems to be uh, one of the effects of this. On the darker side, okay, uh, this tends to increase our recklessness. Okay? People who are positive to toxo, this parasite, are more likely to drive without a seatbelt, okay? to go diving or driving under the influence of, of alcohol. Okay? And, um, and it seems that a toxo, evidence of toxo infection is associated with about 17% of car crashes, car accidents. And uh, um, it also is associated with an increased uh, uh, prevalence of self-harm to the point that the estimate is that about 10% of suicides in the world might be related to a positive infection with this parasite. Okay, so one of our hypotheses is that there may be a biological element there as well, not only an evolutionary or psychological factor as the ones we were exploring before. And if we take this to the planetary level, um, there are uh, thinkers 
like uh, James Lovelock, who in the 60s proposed the Gaia hypothesis and then was supported by Lynn Margulis uh, in the 70s. And this Gaia hypothesis um, invites us to think about uh, the world, the planet, as a living organism that can self-regulate with homeostasis. The planet as a, as a super organism with the ability okay, to, to display resilience and, and adaptability. And, um, and within that uh, uh, theory or hypothesis, uh, we humans might be regarded by this planetary superorganism as an infection. We, humanity, as an infection or a disease like cancer that is threatening the ability of the planet to self-regulate and to be resilient. And advocates of this hypothesis suggest that the Earth is defending from us as a living organism threatened by a, a super species that is harmful. And uh, this can go all the way to even uh, suggesting that there may be microbial, not necessarily parasites, including parasites, and, and, um, but also bacterial or even prionic uh, uh, um, entities that might induce this force at a, at a species scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. And another, another potential explanation could be societal entropy in the sense that this could be just an extension of the second law of thermodynamics, that we're just going from order to chaos, to destruction, to decay, and this is just, this is just the way things are. Another, like, as we start to go through different possibilities, we start to get into what we consider the unknowable, like what happens after you die, right? And what are dreams for and you know questions that we are that that are really difficult for us to really answer so as we go through this uh, a big question that we have like regardless of the source is how can we protect ourselves from the force as much as possible even if we can't explain its source now what can we do yeah this uh, uh, reminds us um, of a good friend and mentor, Canadian, uh, Rick Young. His life mission is to change change, to change the way in which we view change and, and to reimagine uh, uh, how we uh, change in response to the challenges. And in conversation with us, he, he would joke and say, Alex and Tamen, um, I keep asking entrepreneurs, I keep asking world leaders and big decision makers uh, whether they will be willing to join forces with me uh, to design um, a mechanism that would allow humans to be healthier, uh, to reduce the chances of disease, to avoid premature death, and, uh, and to design it in such a way that it would be low cost or could come for free. And, and all of them consistently, Rick said, uh, say, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. And, and then he said, hold on a second, we have invented, we have it already. It's called community. Okay? We have had something very powerful at our disposal okay? to counteract, to try to deal with this self-destructive force. And community, that's a very powerful uh, word that begins with co, and that's Latin for with community, to be a unity with, ideally, each other. Okay? And, uh, and, and there is evidence. There is evidence that communities, these groups of humans, uh, especially when they act as networks of trust, can be very powerful for us. And networks usually have nodes and links. And we tend to pay a lot of attention to the nodes of the network in this case, human beings. But the links tend to be verbs. And they could be emotions. What happens in between. And we tend to place most of our attention on, on the nouns, on the people. So these networks of trust uh, uh, 
invite us to pay attention to the word trust. And trust is a social emotion. You see, there are emotions that only happen when more than one person is involved, and trust is one of them. So trust is the social emotion that occurs as a result of believing that other people would be there for us in a time when we are facing a threat, and that they would be willing and able to act uh, on, our be on our behalf and to, and to do good to us. That is, that is trust. Another key element of these successful communities that act as networks of trust is friendship. Friendship happens when we value another person in our lives. Okay? So these ideal uh, conditions for a community to, to protect us from this self-destructive force have, in general, friendship, okay? and of course, trust. And there is evidence that shows that they, in fact, uh, increase our chances of feeling healthy, of uh, having a low prevalence of disease and premature death, and to lead to higher levels of well-being. Mm -hmm. And what we've realized is also you can't do it alone, right? You can't combat the force by yourself because often you don't even notice, right? Or sometimes you need somebody to help you stay accountable or you know keep you on the track that that you want to that you want to go down. And besides trust and friendship. We consider the antidote for the force two of the other things. And yes, they can be a little bit cringy. And yes, they can seem a little bit soft. But they are powerful. Um, and it's love and wisdom. So what is love? And this is a really key question, especially since most of us want love in our life. Most of us believe that that's something essential in a full, flourishing life, right? What is love? And when you start to think about it a little bit and you get past the romantic interpretations, you start to see that love is much more than that traditional red heart or that you know thing that couples have, right? It, it's something that you have for your family, for your community, for your planet, for, your, for the living systems of which we're a part. So what is love? This was a question that we asked ourselves that I went on a big journey on, and we, and we studied 5,000 years of history on love to understand what did different cultures say about love, different religions, philosophy, science, to try to get to the root of this essential question, because many people can't answer it. And if you start to dig into scientific journals, the answers are actually kind of pathetic and sad and dry and not it at all. Um, and essentially, we found and we concluded after condensing all of this information that love is the ability to wish good, do good, see good, and feel good. Right. So when we're talking about this in terms of the force, it's possible to use love as a tool for you to be able to counteract the force. It's a, it's a good lens to use. Right. You can ask yourself, am I wishing my users well? Am I doing good to the best of my knowledge? Am I seeing them as worthy of this goodness? And is this aligned with who I am and what I need to be well? Right. So will also my design allow others to do the same? So we like to include this example here of Waterlight. It's uh, an innovation from Colombia using 100% recycled and sustainable materials. And it's, uh, it's a power source for people living in really rural communities close to bodies of salt water. So essentially, you put just half a liter of water in there, and you have 45 days of power to power your phones and lights. And this is really great for artisans and young people trying to study and to communicate and to get help and to sell products and to essentially subsist where you're completely off the grid. And it's really beautiful, and it's made from love, with love, for people to continue to perpetuate that cycle. Um, and then similar to love, we have wisdom. Another element that we desire, that we, that we cherish and value, and yet know very little about. And it's at the heart of philosophy. It's love of wisdom. That's what philosophy is. And essentially, wisdom is the ability to know what it is to live well and do everything possible to achieve this, given the circumstances, while enabling others to do the same. 
right? And that's one of the biggest antidotes to the force because it's the opposite. Right? It's the complete opposite. We need more wisdom right now more than ever. And um, these two, love, wisdom, friendship, and trust, are, are going to be the ways that we, can, that we can combat this and we can kind of challenge the force and protect ourselves from it. So the big question now is, what do we do as designers, especially knowing that the self-destructive force is inevitable and a fundamental human factor? What do we do about it? Right? And things are getting pretty weird. I mean, mm -hmm. we have new threats. Mm -hmm. We used to ignore microplastics. Now we are talking about nanoplastics even in the placenta. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and it may be associated with a reduction of sperm that may eliminate sperm and the possibility of reproducing in normal, usual ways mm -hmm. in, in the next 40 years or so. So yeah, we're living or, in crazy, in crazy times. Or controlled artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have choices as designers, as creators, as people who are shaping societies to do something about this, right? So one option is to mitigate the impact, right? And that's very much along the lines of love, wisdom, trust, and friendship, right? That's how we protect ourselves and mitigate the impacts of the force, right? But then some questions arise of, should we direct our efforts to designing products and services that protect users from the force? Is that our mission? Is that what we should do? But what if the force impedes our designs to be successful if the offering is aligned with goodness for people, right? Because if people want what's bad for them and we want to give people what they want or to you know build things and create things that we want people to use and incorporate in their life then do we do is this setting ourselves up for success and our creations for success can we expect designs to be powerful enough to mitigate the force and for societal designs what does this mean for individual agency, right? If we start to become the agents to protect everybody from the force, then is everything then completely sanitized, round edges, padded, protected, or like super controlled to make sure that nobody does harm to themselves, right? What kind of world would we live in if that was the case? I mean, these are questions to just ponder and think like, what do we want? How do we want to respond, right? Because on the other side, we could just magnify it, right? Because if that's what people want, right? If they don't really want what's good for them, then should we just create things that are bad for us, right? Do we want things that just calm our anxiety constantly and just make us feel at ease? And should we just do that, right? Should we magnify the effects of the force because it's gonna make the product or offering successful, right? Do we, if, if, our, if our motivations and if our behaviors are showing that we like that struggle, that we like that suffering, should we then design for that, right? What is ethical, right? What is appropriate? And then also here, from whose perspective, right? Whose perspective are we looking at here? And this is crucial, you see, because we, we are in positions of, of authority when we are thinking about designing products or services or systems or engaging in, in efforts to, to change um, how we behave or how we think or how we feel. But what if there is a misalignment between what we would like to see happening in the world and what humanity actually desires? And, and if we are consistent, would it be unethical, as Tamen was mentioning, if we design things that make people uh, that go along with the force and kind of help them go with the force. Or there's the third perspective, right? And the third perspective is uh, to actually use the force to our advantage. So uh, this could be inspired by, by martial arts that are based on, on our capacity to use energy that could otherwise be harmful to us, okay. usually an opponent and turn it into an advantage. Okay? And this is clear in um, martial arts that derive from jiu-jitsu. Uh, judo is one of them. Aikido is probably uh, the, the most relevant one in terms of the force, because uh, uh, it means the way of unifying with, again, the, the word with, 
uh, with life energy. So could we use the power of the force, and instead of trying to combat it or mitigate it, turn it into something positive? Mm -hmm. So that, that question of what if the force and your recognition of it could be a fuel or inspiration for creative solutions that affect humanity as a whole, we have great examples of that. For example, fortified plant-based foods and products, right? We want that sugar, fat, salt flavor, right? That is what is usually bad for us. But what if we go with the flow of the force and we create products that satisfy that but are actually getting more vitamins into us, more vegetables into us, are better for our ecosystems and for, and for the climate crisis, right? This is one example of how we can go with that flow but actually do good. Another example could be our desire and our tendency in the force to just be sedentary and watch shows when we really shouldn't be watching them, you know, when we have something important to prepare for and we're binge watching or when we should be sleeping and we're watching things. There are organizations like Good Energy, the one that I'm, I'm also working with, uh, they use the methods of the oil lobby and the U.S. military, which has been uh, influencing Hollywood since its inception. Top Gun is one of the biggest uh, recruitment tools for the US Army. And uh, the film industry has been, uh, kind of grew with the oil industry. There was even a, um, a show or a movie about Mickey Mouse going across the country and glamorizing, stopping and fueling up the car, right? Like, these are the kinds of things that are there. So there are movements to use these tools for good in our cinema to shape culture and narrative change. So this is, once again, using our tendency and our desire to binge watch content and watch shows, but have an impact in terms of how our societies are shaped and how we and the choices that we make in life and the careers we start to pursue uh, kind of through these methods. Yeah, and, um, and another big existential threat for us, conflict, conflict across countries or uh, co uh, conflict across uh, groups that have a certain label that is very important uh, for their identity. So the Olympic Games are an example of how this um, propensity that we have uh, as nations or as countries to compete with the others and, and to beat them could be turned into something positive and constructive, you see. And uh, the Olympic Games uh, um, have really pushed the boundaries of what we think is possible to be achieved with our physical capacity. It has led to, to the emergence of entire new sectors of the economy, garments, um, uh, technologies to monitor our, our performance, telecommunications, broadcasting, yeah? working with the force, working with the force that otherwise would be leading to, to armed conflict. Space exploration is another example. Yeah? NASA alone, the space program, has led to over 2,000 uh, spin-offs. Okay? And, and uh, it was the Cold War, okay? And the risk of, 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 of a nuclear conflict that enabled us humans to shift a lot of that uh, propensity again to compete, to feel uh, uh, pride as nations and, and to turn them into something uh, much more constructive. And that is touching pretty much every aspect of our lives now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as it's clear that no single person can beat the force by themselves, right? And we can't really, like, we have a lot of choices now as designers, as creators, as leaders, as to what we want to do now with this knowledge. And the key question that we want to leave you all with to just continue to ponder either now in the Q&A or just on your own in your studio or as you kind of go through life is how will you respond to the self-destructive force in your designs to enable life to thrive, right? There are lots of choices, lots of tools. And lots of risks mm -hmm. and lots of threats. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I don't want to take up space. I know there's questions. So uh, 
whoever's got their hand up fastest gets a mic. And we've got a back left corner. I'm going to come over. I'm a little bit limpy. Please don't laugh. Um, hi, my name is Boris. Hi. Uh, my question, um, my question is in regards to kind of like the way that design has currently uh, played into the self-destructive force, um, especially kind of in regards to uh, people's kind of mental health. Um, I feel like with a lot of uh, new communication technology, there's been like kind of a drive towards maybe self-isolation, which I feel like a lot of the new modern design definitely kind of like supports and encourages. Um, and my question is like, how do you guys, how would you like see maybe like working with the force to counteract that? Yeah. Okay, I, part of the answer is uh, to be here, spending time thinking about it, because it's not easy. Most of the design decisions that we perceive as successful are in general aligned with the force and not to shift them into a positive thing. Um, and, and it's not easy because uh, and it, it's a big challenge. And that is, I would say, at the, at the heart of the, design, of the design brief. Nevertheless, we are seeing increasing numbers of examples that, that point us in, in a direction that should give us more hope. And yeah, I just wanted to kind of con like add to your answer that part of it does have to, and I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but part of it does have to do with us too, because these companies and these, you know, these platforms only thrive because we use them and we allow them to continue to thrive, right? And that is our force also perpetuating the force even more because we have even worked and Alex has been approached by big executives at some of the largest consumer goods, food products, like we're not gonna name them, but really the biggest. And the idea was to create pro like for the healthy products and products in sustainable packaging to outsell the ones that are traditionally in the vending machines. That was the mission, that was the dream, the infrastructure was there, the desire, the design, everything was there. But the consumers weren't buying it to the same degree as the other products, right? So it becomes this tricky situation where it requires all of us and it's not easy. And that's kind of why we need to have these conversations and be here and also, maybe create even such irresistible designs that it's just, you know, there's no competition. Before we go to the next question, um, buildingh.org, Tom Getz and Steve Downs, um, they've started a group to try to create insights into how products are affecting our lives, to drive those products to affect our lives in the right way. So I would check out Building H. It's highly related to what you're doing. Did you want to go next? Oh, yeah, I did. And then if somebody wants to raise their hand afterwards, I'll know where to go. OK, so I was interested by your mentions of how very, like disease spread could cause more reckless behavior, which could then do it, as well as in your note of how catalytic events, like for example, the space race and such, could allow you to work with the force in order to achieve more societal productivity rather than harm. So I was curious if you think it's possible that knowing that with climate change and such, pandemics are more likely to happen in the future, and knowing that reckless behavior, like people's ignoring lockdowns, going to parties, et cetera, has contributed greatly to their spread, if you think that, and as well noting, I guess, the rise in educational adaptations that sort of very much spiked in the frequency of accommodating students and discovering new ways of doing learning that allow students more, that help to sort of cater to people in a different way than was the conformist way thought of before the pandemic. I'm curious if you think that that sort of design could be applied further into like other areas of societal design or if it could be applied even further into education with the likely increasing prevalence of pandemics and other disasters in general. For example, designing a around people's recklessness or even to exploit people's recklessness in a way that allows them to develop more societal innovations or otherwise to be able to develop things that help society rather than hindering it and to work with the sort of forces in that way to build things that can help people to learn better and to 
create new ideas that can uh, go to society through the use of is using people's own tendencies towards self-destruction as a way of creating even more smaller catalytic events or even small ideas which can be saved for a greater catalytic event as to accelerate the course of progress. Yes, and we believe that if we had to bet amongst the three, the three options that we uh, shared with you, uh, given how long the force has been with us, how powerful it is, and how resistant it appears to be to evidence and to knowledge. Um, if we had to bet on one, is to, is to use it to our advantage. And that requires a lot of creativity, because the line would be very fine in terms of using the force for our benefit and versus reinforcing our propensity to hurt ourselves. So this will require very fine thinking and, and a lot of deliberate uh, decision making and, um, and, and luck, I would say. We tend not to talk about luck a lot. And luck plays a big, big role here. And, um, and we were lucky in terms of the pandemic. It may sound uh, uh, crazy to say it, but we were really lucky. And we have had over 2,000 years of pandemics. Evidence, one of, you see, for over 2,000 years. And, and uh, our hope is that we have learned something from what we just experienced. Um, because another is coming. So this is the time. We have a window here. And these are exactly the questions that we're saying is how can we now, in response to the next pandemic, channel our our the force to actually protect more people, you know, rather than saying, don't go out and don't do this and do this, right? Like, and expecting that that's going to help. It's like, what can we be doing? What kind of measures can we design and implement that work with the force and actually save many lives and do it in a different way that we have been for thousands of years? there were some other years. side effects. We noticed mm -hmm. loneliness as a big issue and isolation. You were mentioning the fact that we, uh, and with huge impacts on, impact on, on our mental health, uh, well, this is, we have a window of opportunity and it's not going to be very wide and it's not going to be open for a long time. So we need boldness, we need audacity, we need courage okay, to, to actually try things that might help us overcome it. Hi, I'm Joshua. Um, so how do you see a future civilization that successfully combats this force um, looking like? Do you, want to, do you want to go? You go. If not, we do rock, paper, scissors. And, uh, um, well, I mean, that's kind of why I think we're here, right? Like, that's, that's, up for, that's up to us. And that's kind of the question that we wanted to float to everybody, is that that's what we're here to do, is to design these societies, is to notice we can't be doing more of the same. And we can't be trying to and, and just ignoring all the signs of the force, right? We need to start asking these questions now as we're building from ground up, right? So it's beautiful that we have these unknowns, but that's what that's... That's what it is all about, right? Is it, it has to look different, though. We need to pay attention to what's happening. And just a graph mm -hmm. on, on CO2 accumulation mm -hmm. and temperature increase is indicating that we are becoming uh, um, Rapa Nui, mm -hmm. this uh, Easter Island, at the planetary level. So if we don't do anything and we keep describing things and hoping that mm -hmm. things are going to change by themselves, we're going to find ourselves very much in the same situation as those islanders who were unable to leave mm -hmm. and ended up eating rats and each other. But essentially, so, like more of the same. It's like if we do combat the force, it will not look like what we are currently doing. <laughs> more questions? Yeah, I, I have a question about um, doing the Aikido with the force. And when we're exploring designs with users and we see the force at work, um, it seems to me that a, a, one of the missing keys beyond love and wisdom is a long-term perspective. And so if people are thinking, what am I going to eat right now? What's going to make me feel good right now? And we ask the question, and then what? And what are the consequences of this right now? And the answer could be, it's just one hamburger. Um, 
rather than one plant-based substitute that's healthier and tasty. How do you see injecting a more long-term, because right now with all the existential threats and the very high prevalence of anxiety across all generations, um, how do we uh, reinstill a sense of long-term purpose as opposed to short-term gain as part of that redirection of the force? Yeah, so I kind of want to hop in there if you don't mind. Okay, perfect. So one of the one of the sources of the force that we proposed was um, was our relationship to ourselves through time, and that our future self is almost uh, a stranger to our current self. And this is being studied by really interesting professors at UCLA also, and um, talking about this. And they've been working with banks, for example, to get people to build a stronger relationship with themselves through time. And is and in their studies, they have found some really interesting examples that uh, actually our language changes the degree of closeness that we have with our future self. There are, so there are some languages that are future oriented, that al and there are some who almost don't make a distinction between the two. And, they've, and these studies have found that people in those societies who speak those languages make better decisions, right? So I think exercises that help us have that stronger connection, be more aware, and, and uh, bond with ourselves further forward uh, will definitely have a have a big impact in terms of our health and our society and how we combat the force. I don't yeah. know if you want to no, this that. is this is complex mm -hmm. and, and 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 uncertain. Mm -hmm. And if we follow the evidence, we are in trouble. You, you see, so so and there is no clear answer. This force seems to be very very powerful, and um, and it's down to us to prove that those who think that we are doomed are wrong. Okay, but those who believe that artificial intelligence is the last invention of humanity and that very soon we are going to have uh, aliens here who are going to be smarter and stronger and replace us, everything seems to be pointing in that direction. Are we willing, you see, to, to do things in a more aggressive, more audacious, more courageous way than we have done it now? understanding that the stakes couldn't be higher, and conflict is spreading around the world. <laughs> so the, some people call the meta-crisis. Okay? So we have this existential crisis feeding each other. Down to us. Uh, it's down to us. There is no other group that could make the decisions or at least try their best. The question is, are we willing? Are we ready? Are we, and we capable? Need to, and we need to take it seriously. Right, because it, it, it comes in those little bits like, oh, it's just a hamburger. Oh, you know, it's just a couple more episodes. Oh, you know, I'll just get or this. Somebody else exactly. will it or somebody out. else will figure it out. Exactly. We have to take it really seriously. Or we always come through. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So far. <laughs> All right, my name is Jerry. Just had a quick question. What are you doing now in your business to use the self destructive force for, for your advantage or your personal life? Just one example. Go for it. And this is this is something that we were that we were um, talking about a lot, and we're, we're, it's it's more like which example to give because we have been everything that we design we do take into consideration. We're like, but there is the force, right? And how are we going to use that to instigate people to do the right thing? So um, it's all been about making things, making the right choice. And it's very much like Richard Thaler theories of making the right choice the easiest, essentially, and, um, and meeting people where they are, and also tapping into um, just really aligning with what people are already wanting, but like Trojan horsing uh, the right solutions in there. I don't know if you want to if you want to add on to this, like, because it's just it's we're we're like we're doing it in like a lot of our activities. Yeah, well, I think that would be that would be yeah e enough. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, let me uh, to be very blunt. Mm -hmm. um, I have tried most of my life to counteract the force. If you look at my life, it's been trying to do as much good as possible. And I can show you scars of every possible weapon that you can imagine. And, um, 
um, and now the big, the big decision is um, along the lines of the third one. And we have two or three options, and, and we are concerned that if we go with the fourth, it may backfire. Um, and uh, so, but we are going to bet on that one. And we are betting on that one. Um, and I think you stop short of describing examples because there is some magic in this. It's like the placebo effect. If, if you, and, and there, is a study, there are studies now showing that the placebo effect works even if you tell the person that it's a placebo in certain areas. But, um, but some of the things we, we, we are trying or will be trying require, um, require a lot of care in terms of, of handling them. And it, they may backfire, but we are prepared to. Exactly, and usually a lot of it has to do with aligning the incentives. Like it's always like, what are the incentives? What are the incentives? And Can trying to. Just an example. I would. Yeah, go for okay. it. OK. So this is publicly no, known. And I didn't want to plug products. So you asked us, mm -hmm. we are going to, to, to get it. Um, we, we have developed a product called Notch. Notch is an amino acid you take before sleep. And it protects your sleep. It protects your sleep. It increases the, the protects your REM sleep, helps you go to sleep faster and deeper. And this is working with the force that is inviting us to sleep less and to work harder, you understand, and to achieve more. And all those things that are not necessarily good for us. So we believe that something like that, that is not trying to enable people to sleep more, but to allow people to sleep less in a better way. But like give them better quality sleep, even though the there's... little sleep exactly. they get, knowing exactly. that the tendency will be to less sleep, not to most, more sleep. Yeah. Where the cane is coming out and we're getting dragged yes. off. <laughs> so yes, if you'd like to continue the conversation further, you know, please use the hashtag uh, resilient and then tag us at uh, Design Lab UCSD. If you have any comments, thoughts, or in, you know, share that with us, and we'll we'll keep posted on Instagram or Twitter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Navarro. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you for coming out.